Thank you very much. Um, I'm really pleased that Mika is moderating because if it weren't for Mika, this wouldn't be happening. Um, and I think for years and years, uh, she and, and other members of the team within SERP uh, have made this happen for the whole university. And I think we should all give a round of applause to you. So, you know, 50,000 people in the desert, you know, second biggest crop ever. And then many, many different stories, you know, depending on where you stand and who you are and how you look at what a cop is for and where we are in the climate crisis, you can come away with a very different story. Was this, the, was this the COP where the gas industry made sure that it was understood as a clean, if not a cleaner or clean, depending on which paragraph of the text you read, a energy solution? Was this the Africa COP? Well, if so, then a historic agreement on loss and damage basically engineered because of Pakistan's intransigence and refusal to, 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 to be kicked to the side but where was the agreement on a global uh, goal on adaptation and where was really uh, any major agreement on funding for adaptation, which is what Africa really wanted. So did Africa get what it wanted? I we can talk about that more. Uh, this, was an, uh, this was a historic uh, COP in that the developing countries by hanging together and by some very, uh, I think, dex um, clever diplomacy um, were able to, um, use the particular sort of moral high ground of this particular year to get the EU to move on its position on loss and damage. And then we can discuss what really happened between the EU, the UK, the US and Switzerland. And then, you know, but the EU didn't get what it wanted in return. It got some of what it wanted in return, but not all of it, which was, you know, who, for whom is this fund uh, going to be uh, available? Is, is this something for just the most vulnerable? Is this going to be for, uh, wider world of, of development countries and where did China and India fit into these kinds of new discussions. So are we are we discussing this as the world exists today or are we discussing this as the world existed in 1992 at the beginning of the of the of the whole convention process. So uh, others are going to pick up on uh, let me just focus on a couple of things. This was supposed to be the implementation cops so all about implementation stupid as somebody once said. <laughs> what the things to look for now is that I think we, you know, there's a feeling that the way that the COPs are organized has kind of run its course. And the big question is in the run up to Paris, COPs had to do one thing. In the time between Paris and 2015 and the agreements on the rule book, COPs had to do another thing. Now, COPs have to organize implementation or have to be a place where implementation gets spurred. So, how would we organize them? And that is now on the to do list of Simon Steele, the new. Executive Secretary of the UNCCC. The other thing that is on his to-do list that was given to him by the Secretary General at COP is to work out how do we hold everybody accountable. Last year in Glasgow, there was a big fuss about greenwashing. The private sector arrived. It said it was going to involve this money. It was committed to net zero. Everybody could sort of poke holes in those net zero commitments. A year later, a commission called for the Secretary General actually sort of described how we must understand net zero and what a net zero pledge must mean, setting a very high political bar. Red line around greenwashing was the headline, but now the commission didn't enter into, well, how do you hold non-state actors accountable? If the city of Paris says that it's going to be net zero by 2040, how do you hold them accountable for a short-term target or for that eventual achievement? That is something now that the UNFCCC is being tasked to do. And there'll be different elements of that, which I think will be important areas for research for some of our students. So those governments are there to do two things, to negotiate and to basically participate in a trade fair for action. Non-state actors are there to participate in that trade, act, trade fair for action and also to involve themselves in advocacy. And if you saw those three buckets, then I think on the negotiations, it didn't go as well as we expected. And we can talk about the mechanics of why, the mechanics of the presidency, the mechanics of the secretariat, and why it was only really on the Thursday of the second week that any kind of cover text started to emerge, which would deal with all of the things that have to be dealt with that aren't in the, that aren't in the Paris Agreement. And when you think of the critical elements of the climate crisis right now, most of them are outside of the Paris Agreement. 
So that cover text and the role of the presidency has become so much more important in recent years. But why did the Egyptians wait until the end of the second week? Even as late as the Monday, the, uh, the point person for the Egyptians uh, uh, was basically saying, well, you know, do we really need a cover text? I mean, some people say we don't. Uh, so it came very late in the day. So the negotiation peak wasn't so good. The, the trade fair, I think, was a very, very good trade fair, apart from sort of the physical conditions in which it was held, in that there were extraordinary numbers of important deals being done. I mean, real deals, uh, you know, actual investments being signed, uh, concrete partnerships being evolved. Uh, and I think that that, uh, you know, how you continue to do that, but also have negotiations which are successful, I think is a big question. And then the advocacy impaired this year, impaired because a lot of people couldn't go, couldn't get there, were arrested on the way there, weren't able to freely move around and weren't able to freely engage with each other. The question of whether that matters or not is, is also something to, to, to be discussed. Not, there is not universal agreement on that point. So uh, a couple of highlights because then I'll, I'll run out of time. Um, I think the finance discussion became a profoundly different conversation. A year ago, the private sector arrived and sort of said, look, we've got bags of cash. You know, we just need to be facilitated to be able to invest it in the right things. That facilitation hasn't happened because most countries don't have regulations or administration in place. Most countries don't have effective pricing on carbon within their economies. Most countries don't have any of the things that would be needed in place to sort of drive investment into green and away from brown. In many places, just the awareness of what sovereign risks are going to be related to the wind down of brown and the wind up of green are not really understood. But we started to have the conversation about 2.1c. 2.1c basically said that financial flows have to move in support of Paris. Well, that's everything. That's not the 100 billion finance, the climate finance target, which of course was missed again, and was actually, rather than being something that was apologized for, was actually dismissed. John Kerry actually said, well, you know, if I get 90 out of 100 in the test, I think that's pretty good. And these are the developing countries to understand that therefore, having approximately 90 billion of 100 billion was something that they should be grateful for. It didn't go down very well. So um, we actually started talking about the financial system and its need for reform. This, of course, has been a drumbeat over the last two years from Mia Motley and others. And of course, the speech that she made at the General Assembly was then repeated at the annual meetings of the Fund of the Bank. And of course, then uh, was repeated again uh, in the plenary at the opening uh, of Sharm el Sheikh. What changed this time was that Emmanuel Macron, in, in, in classic style, jumped on the Bridgetown Initiative and embraced it for himself, uh, which basically means that you have European leaders si si signaling that they are prepared to sit down and have a substantial conversation about the writing off of unsustainable debt. He then went to Bali, where he said that not only would there now be a mere motley um, a, a eminent persons group to look at this agenda, to report out at the IMF World Bank meetings in spring, but that he would now call a global conference in June 2023, 12, 12 months before we celebrate 80 years of the Bretton Woods institutions. So the reform of MDBs and reform or changes to the international financial system is now fully on the agenda, even though the hook language that we wanted into 2.1c isn't fully there. There has been an agreement only to set up a Sharm el Sheikh dialogue on these big questions. Public funds, $300 million into the loss and damage fund, bits and pieces into the adaptation fund, basically a big fat nothing burger, as Dan Dresden would say. <laughs> Private funds, the 150 trillion that was sort of earmarked as being funding for net zero or funds that would need to be invested for net zero pathway, you started to see some very important platforms established for that money to be leveraged, but nowhere near at scale. The Americans have said that the $20 billion uh, investment under the JetP for the Just Energy Transition Partnership for Indonesia is the biggest ever climate finance deal ever signed. Some of the private sector people would quibble with that, but the big question is the ratio of grant money to debt money to equity money and whether or not that will actually work. We'll have to see on December 14th when a similar package is announced for Vietnam whether or not that, uh, that is uh, improved. The early signs are that the Vietnamese are somewhat uncomfortable with the ratios that are being established there. But you saw lots of blending, lots of leveraging, lots of changes in the way that certain instruments are worked. And you saw 
insurance type instruments come to the fore, especially as the Germans trying to build a deal around loss and damage finance basically put forward a green shield, which is a way of grouping together a lot of different insurance instruments, including parametric insurance, as a way to try to find flows of funds to, to, to the emerging markets. And then finally, carbon markets. Article 6 discussions, again, big fat nothing burger, but in fact, we went backwards because we opened the door to untransparency and we also closed the door on indigenous people's rights, rights holders and human rights. This will have to be revisited at COP28 in order for Article 6 to move forward. But at this point, it's the relative question of whether or not Article 6 is ever going to move forward effectively and what do we do therefore, which meant that a lot of the attention continued to be on voluntary carbon markets. And there we saw um, uh, a lot of work that's happened in the last year to start to build the guardrails or the rules for a new market and the transparency uh, for a new market. An extraordinary amount of private activity in the voluntary space with London, Singapore, Switzerland coming up with exchanges which will now help build high integrity, and then Egypt offering to host an African carbon exchange. You saw an African carbon markets initiative. Can these markets actually work for Africa, for nature solutions, but also potentially for deindustrialization, in particular in South Africa? And you saw headlines around an announcement that was premature made by uh, the Americans again uh, about whether or not voluntary carbon markets could be used. Uh, to help uh, um, decommission coal. The work on that has started now. And then finally, I'd say the COP is a crescendo, right? And then there's a, there's a build up and a build down. But what's interesting is that the build up never becomes a build down anymore from COP27 to COP28 because we're out of time. And so this week, it's important to note that the EU has actually announced its registry on carbon credits. The Vanuatu has published its resolution uh, to the General Assembly members for its claim to the International uh, Court of Justice. And that in Paris, as we speak, Macron and Mia Motley's team are working out who will be on their eminent person's team. So the work goes on. So a lot to be disappointed about, but a lot of movement nevertheless. Thank you. Okay. Um, Dean Kite covered a lot of ground. I'll probably uh, go in and, and kind of talk in a little more depth on some of these topics. Uh, but first, I just wanted to seem set a little bit uh, for those of you who haven't been at a COP before. I, this will reveal how old I am. I first went to a, a COP, it was COP2. And this was after college, before graduate school, when I was working for an environmental NGO uh, based in Washington, DC. And um, at that COP, I think there were like 1,500 people. Um, and then the big, the big COP was COP3, and that was when the Kyoto Protocol was adopted in 1997. And um, at that COP, everyone was like really shocked because I think there were three to 5,000 people. Um, and now when you go to one of these COPs, I mean, I actually don't know what the final tally was, something like 40,000, right? I think it was close to 50. Closer to 50. So it is really a bewildering experience. Um, and I think some of the people who were there who, who, who can attest to that, this was a particularly bewildering experience because they constructed, you know, basically a UN conference center in the middle of the desert. I mean, there was one pre-existing building and then they they basically had a bunch of warehouses that had been assembled, you know, around it. Um, and as Dean Kite just mentioned, you've got a lot of different things happening all at the same time, and and they're operating in a concurrent fashion, but they're also interacting with each other. So we have an area where where they have what they call the pavilions area. And this year, I think there were five buildings, big warehouse buildings for these different pavilions. And at these different pavilions, you have essentially a conference going on, lots of events happening and um, sometimes deals being signed and you know public announcements being made and promotion of certain technologies or initiatives or whatever, what have you. And we, we were all speaking at events in these pavilions, many of which are 
sponsored by countries, but not necessarily only countries. You've also got um, associations and um, different NGOs and different business concerns hosting these pavilions. Um, and then you have a, the sort of a, what's known as the official side event space, where you have official side events that have been proposed by different observer organizations and country organizations. And these are also kind of like conference. And we, Tufts, the Climate Policy Lab, had an official side event that both Abai and I spoke at um, on Af renewable energy in Africa. And then you've got the actual negotiations going on. <clears throat> There's also a gigantic media center and thousands of journalists there who are covering this and bringing a lot of attention to these issues. So navigating this is really tricky and complicated. Um, and that's just the blue zone, right? Yeah. And then there's a, a whole, I didn't even make it. This was the first year, I think, I didn't even make it to what's known as the green zone, which is the civil society zone, where there's even more events going on. And usually there's a lot of public protests going on. And of course that was super constrained at this pop. Um, so those of us who uh, are kind of nerdy observers yeah. of the negotiation and who have been in and out of the negotiation process like Dean Kite and myself, you know, it, that, it was particularly hard, I think, to track what was going on because there were big distances and it was difficult to get back and forth among these different uh, zones. Um, but let me spend a few minutes talking about what I think are some of the most important uh, outcomes. Um, so I'll start with climate finance. While this was supposed to be the Africa COP and the implementation COP, to me, it felt like a climate finance COP. And the headline, of course, was the decision to establish a new fund on loss and damage. Um, now, they took the whole time to just, you know, come to a decision to do that. Um, so no details exist at all about how this fund will work, uh, who will be contributing to the fund. Um, and the plan is to have basically a process over the course of the next year to try to work through some of these, you know, very difficult issues. Um, and um, uh, meanwhile, uh, largely European governments made some individual commitments. You know, certain governments said we'll pay, you know, a few <laughs> ten million here and ten million there, um, and and begin to get money flowing uh, for loss and damage. Um, but um, I think that was in a way a surprise. And um, at the beginning of the of the negotiation, they added loss and damage as a formal agenda item. And and so that was like in a you know some initial excitement, right? That oh this actually made it formally onto the agenda. That rarely happens at the last minute that there is a you know, addition to the agenda. And so in a way, this was a surprise outcome, although it shouldn't have been a surprise given that uh, developing countries and in particular, the Alliance of Small Island State countries have been arguing for decades, you know, that, that we really need to consider how uh, developing countries will be compensated for the losses and damages associated with climate change, including like the eradication of a, of a whole country, which is a real prospect now for some of these small island states. Um, on, so that was the progress made, which was very limited. I think highly symbolic, but as a practical matter, very limited. Then we had this question of long-term finance. And this is really like, okay, how are we gonna mobilize all the money that is needed for mitigation and adaptation and supporting um, development models and, and economic development that's climate friendly. Um, and here we had uh, essentially no progress. Um, the cover decision, I think for the first time, I haven't had a chance to verify that, maybe Dean Tyson 
refresh my memory, but I, I think for the first time, the cover decision calls on the MDBs and international financial institutions um, to reform themselves, to define a new vision and operational model, um, and, and to do that by the next top. Uh, this kind of follows on recent calls, both from Secretary Yellen and from, I think, the Germans, uh, also for the shareholders, in particular of the World Bank, uh, to, re to require the World Bank to, to come up with a new plan for how they're going to bring climate into their, um, into their uh, operational plan. Um, <clears throat> and then there is this part of the negotiation to establish a new goal for climate finance a new like longer term goal beyond the hundred billion dollars that was um, enshrined in the Paris Agreement. Um, and the negotiations on that were very slow and uh, unproductive, I think. And that's supposed to conclude uh, next year for post 2025. Um, I think to me, it was a real surprise that there weren't more calls for what I think of as the middle income countries to start contributing to global climate finance. And I'm thinking here of um, countries like the UAE, where the next COP will be held, the Saudis, the Chinas, countries that um, are still considered part of the G77 um, and thus, you know. Mm -hmm don't have an obligation under the convention to contribute climate finance to developing countries, um, but yet have the capability to do that and maybe have a moral obligation as you know, big fossil fuel producers and emitters. So I was surprised not to hear more calls for that, though there were some and they were muted, but I think cautiously this idea was being put on the table. Um, and then I think the role of the private sector is really um, a big question. And, and the private sector really was called out um, in terms of its inability to deliver in an accountable way uh, real volumes of climate finance. I mean, we really just basically have no idea because there's no mechanism for them to report. And it is appearing like this just gigantic greenwash, as the guy said. Uh, but to me, you know, I just feel like there's a lot of smoke and mirrors where they're trying to, you know, present themselves as, you know, being wanting to contribute to solving the problem, uh, but not being very concrete about exactly how they're going to do that and then hold them, hold themselves accountable. So in short, I think we have a really big financing gap that still exists, in particular, a gigantic gap on adaptation. Um, and although there were some pledges to increase adaptation finance, for example, President Biden pledged to double adaptation finance. And that sounds good when you hear that at first blush, but then you realize he's just doubling from 50 million to 100 million, and you realize how absurdly small uh, these pledges are. So we have a really big financing gap and um, no real answers for developing countries about how they can actually pursue a low carbon resilient development model and get the financing they need to support um, economic growth in a climate constrained world. <clears throat> so that brings me to implementation. And this was supposed to be the theme of the COP. Um, but it was bizarre how little focus there was actually on implementation. Um, and, you know, the NDCs have really not evolved. Uh, we had a lot of announcements last year in Glasgow on um, updates to country nationally determined contributions. Um, but since then, as the UN emission gap uh, report states, there's been negligible change in country NDCs. And we're currently on track with existing policies for a 2.8 degree centigrade rise in emissions by the end of the century. So, you know, this is just important to keep this big picture in mind. You know, the Paris Agreement calls for holding global temperatures to two degrees centigrade 
and ideally 1.5. And there's a lot of hand wringing now about whether we're keeping 1.5 degrees alive or not. And I think the answer is no, <laughs> we're not on track. We're not even close to being on track. Um, and the fact that very few countries are updating their NDCs, there's no momentum around that uh, seemingly at all is really concerning. And furthermore, uh, very little progress, except a couple of notable exceptions for implementation policies at the domestic level, at the national level for many of these countries. So they've set forth these NDCs, but they're not getting implementation legislation passed um, and getting themselves on track to be able to um, achieve their, their targets. Um, of course, we did have the significant progress in the United States this summer um, with the Inflation Reduction Act, the Infrastructure Act, the Chips and Science Act, all of which get the U.S. in a much better position to at least plausibly be able to potentially achieve their targets. Um, but a lot of other countries haven't yet done that. Uh, the EU is an important uh, exception. Um, and, and this raises another gap, I think, which is that the industrialized countries haven't done nearly enough to support the developing countries to get the, the policy infrastructure in place um, so that they are in turn on track to be able to um, achieve their own NDCs. This is work that our climate policy lab here at Fletcher uh, is engaged in. We're trying to support a limited number of developing countries with that type of work, but uh, there really needs to be a much more systematic, scalable um, set of work. And I had hoped that there would be more discussion about how the world was going to support developing countries um, to do this kind of capacity building and providing this kind of technical advice uh, going forward. And let me conclude by just saying, you know, two of the most important things that happened didn't happen at the COP, but happened at the G20, <laughs> which was happening in a concurrent fashion. One was the fact that President Biden and Xi Jinping finally met face to face and, um, and seemingly have relaxed this prohibition uh, against US-China dialogue on climate change. Uh, that didn't manifest into really much of anything while we were actually at the top, but I think it now allows for a conversation to take place between those two countries going forward, which is important kind of intrinsically as these two biggest emitters, you know, kind of play this dance together about who's going to do what going forward, but also I think can be very important for the negotiation going forward because in the past few years, we've been able to see the US and China be very constructive together in the context of the international negotiations. And then I think also the jet key for Indonesia was exciting. Um, and the, the sort of momentum around establishing these jet keys, uh, which is the just energy transition partnership mechanism is exciting, um, though worrying to me in two ways. Um, the, the first worry I have is that we're saddling developing countries with even more debt um, and not really providing them uh, with, the, with the finance they really need. And then second of all, I'm worried we're just gonna have jet fees for the biggest emitters and not the jet fees for the you know, potential, like everybody else. Um, and so I worry we're gonna sort of run out of money and attention and momentum uh, after we do, you know, two or three more of these. Um, so with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Lots of chew on here. Um, a bye. <coughs> Thanks so much. It's very difficult to speak up here. So, how many years? You're up to it. Yeah. So, okay, I just want to have add one point, on, especially on agriculture. The COP has ever discussed agriculture before. This time we discuss agriculture, which is which is for me for Africa again very important. But the discussion was also focusing on satellite types. 
you know, all the human rights. So, although there's a discussion of agriculture, but the nature of the discussion was you not know, in the way that could help developing countries. It was mainly on the supply side, on the technology side. So I think that was kind of the missing link. It was good, but it has also all limitations. I think I have also participated in the African ministerial meeting. So I can show you what their translations are and what their hopes are to. I think the, the COP was, you know, just insufficient in terms of progress. For Africa, as they say, it is insufficient. It is hectic, chaotic, but no much progress. Especially the mitigation, as uh, Dean Kerry mentioned, the mitigation was Africa was hoping to see more ambition in terms of mitigation. But advanced countries were not more ambitious in their mitigation. And then loss and damage is because of lack of mitigation led us to adaptation and lack of funding led us to loss and damage. So tragic that is clear we were doing it. I think this is maybe because as Dean Kat mentioned, the you know, superpowers, they usually had a meeting before a COP and China and US wasn't collaborative or partnership in that field for this coming coming COP. And that might have played a less progress in the in the, in the in this in this call. So for this reason, the developing countries are tended to practice it, kind of lose confidence on multinational organizations. So there is a tendency frustrating on the big international organizations. So they are preferring more bilateral as the way of Shenzhen multilateral. I think this could be very important for academics because if we are decarbonization, then are we, is it deglobalizing de us or more creating globalization? Because we don't see much more partnerships, we see more competition. And if we are decarbonizing our economy, we might use local generated energies. So that might lead us more you know, deglobalization. Or when we do our research in Africa, we see some parts of protectionism. We see the same India is putting more ladies on Chinese to put you know, PVs in the thing. So I think that's kind of another area of research, which I have also observed in Africa and which as they say we should reevaluate our policies, our agenda. I think that's the thing I just I just get observation from Africa and Israel. I think another point which is kind of I saw was a progress was disappointing in some way. There is a big gap between commitment and even implementation. Are we going to achieve decarbonization or are we going to fail? Because the gap is so huge. Can we make it decarbonization net zero by the target date? So it's very, it's very frustrating because when we see that the accredited NDC, and we only, uh, I think, I think the synthesis was made and then there's an increasing emission by 13.7. With those updated NDCs, it's not a reduction emission, but increasing emission by 13.7%. IPT says, IPT says we have to reduce emission by 43%. But the updated NDC shows an increasing by more than 10%. That means there's a huge gap. So this might lead us kind of competition rather than partnerships between, between countries and between regions. I think, as I said, maybe the bigger powers of partnership might, might help Africa. But from Africa side, 
in the African special needs and circumstances, there was an agenda for African needs and special circumstances, which is in the convention, Article 3E was mentioned African special needs and special circumstances should be in support. But that issue has been evolving for many years, and now become every kind every region has become more vulnerable. Latin America and small islands all are vulnerable. They are also asking to be considered in this special medicine circumstance. I think that I don't think that's moving forward. So that was the big disappointment for Africans. So when you see the totality in terms of mitigation, finance, and African special medicine circumstances, didn't go through. So I don't think this this was an African call. And I don't know what you call it, but the next one is we're going to Saudi Arabia, no. UAE, which is big power with oil producer. The money is accumulated through oil producer. And if we are hoping that the US and the China will have a partnership, but if, we, if that didn't happen, I don't know where we're going. To. Because we have seen that the COP, this COP was kind of Egypt's COP in some way. And the country hosting country makes many of the decisions and will have part from the UKI. Then the next would be by oil producing countries who have whose wealth is depend on oil. It's just a little bit difficult to 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 anticipate what. Well. Another thing what I have seen in this COP is there were so many oil producer companies and gas companies. And the discussion was mainly not on emission reduction, on clean tech. And how to clean that. Even the India suggestion to phase down coal didn't get accepted. So, what was decided on COP26 was copied in this COP without expanding to include gas and oil. It just they copied the, the 26 decision into this decision. And I think that was kind of made more disappointing. So they are more disappointing than, than progressive, I think, uh, from my perspective. So for us, it has just more yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I will keep my remarks short. I know we've gone a bit long, but I actually, this is my first talk. Um, so I'm a second year MOLD student, um, and I had the good fortune to be on the test delegation, but actually I owe a buy a thank you copy, um, because a buy um, got a badge on another delegation, um, which was why I was um, able to come up the last minute, so thank you, Abai. Um, but I feel like my time at COP27 on a very particular and specific mechanism um, that I think was actually a bit quiet at COP. Um, so uh, I focused on the global stock take, and for those who don't know, it's a mechanism that's written to the Paris Agreement um, that sometimes called the ratchet mechanism, but it's really intended to increase the ambition of the nationally determined contributions of countries. So as we kind of discussed, that has been proven incredibly difficult. Um, even last year after countries agreed that they would update their NDCs, we saw very little of that. Um, and so the global stock take has this really difficult task of finding a way to put pressure on countries to catalyze that ambition. The way it does that is by um, trying to assess collective progress of the international community towards the goals of the Paris Agreement. Um, and so basically, um, the, uh, it, it's interesting how we're going to define collective progress, I think. Um, and that's one of the main challenges that it has set out for it. Um, but really, the stock take, this is the first one that's ever happening under Paris. Um, it's meant to happen every five years, and there are three phases. Um, the first phase started last year in Glasgow, um, and that's really the information collection phase. So that's um, taking in all the inputs, the country reports that get submitted to the UNFCCC, um, as well as expert um, and external reports to the process, but on emissions um, largely, um, and then also towards adaptation and towards um, the means of implementation, which is capacity building and the finance that we've talked about. Um, what happened at COP27 was phase two. Um, it's actually part two of phase two. It's 
in typical fashion, very complicated, I found. Um, but the technical dialogues are kind of the, the in-person stakeholder conversations. So there are country representatives as well as non-state actors in conversation. The first dialogue happened in June in Bonn. The second one's at COP27. There's going to be another round in March. And so it's kind of this iterative um, what's happening, how, how do we, you know, go about answering this collective progress question, but also how do we distill best practices? So that's kind of the, the talk that, that started to emerge um, in the technical dialogue. And then phase three will happen next year at COP28 in the UAE. Um, so that's actually when they're going to present the findings of the stock case. So when, when sort of the, the paper comes due and we try to actually increase our ambition, um, my involvement, um, another thank you to Dean Kite. Um, so she was an expert, um, one of the experts um, that was nominated to partake in the global stock take. Um, and she reached out to the UNFCCC team on my behalf and said, do you need an assistant? <laughs> um, and I was able to, it, it turned out they did. Um, and so I was um, able That's to. <laughs> <laughs> so I was one of the note takers for some of the global stock take round tables. Um, and kind of got a front row seat um, to some of the some of the negotiations that was happening. There were many parts of the stock take that were happening though. Um, and of course, one of the big critiques of the stock take, as with many other parts of the negotiations, is that it's difficult for countries with smaller delegations to fully participate um, in, in, in both giving their inputs, but also affecting negotiations. So the stock take was no, um, no uh, different in that regard. But, um, some general thoughts I had on the stock take. Um, so these, you know, there are other inputs that are happening as part of it. Um, but what happened at COP27 was really um, supposedly focused technical dialogues on these big overarching questions. So, you know, how do we assess progress towards our decarbonization goals? Um, how do we, like in, in tandem with the global goal on adaptation that has yet to be agreed, how do we even assess adaptation goal of progress in a world that has a changing climate. So the bar is constantly moving. Um, and then, you know, we talked a lot about capacity building and countries had a lot of questions, right? So we, the, the experts in the room were meant to be answering these questions and they were answering them with questions themselves, right? On where is the capacity building that we need in order to meet some of, um, you know, our obligations under the agreement, but also when will you catalyze the finance? Like when will we actually see the finance necessary in order to make um, our programs happen? So um, one big takeaway though I, that I had was that non-state actors were really present in the global stock take. Um, I think that that's partially because you know subnational governments, so cities and regions, but also indigenous groups feel really left out of the process other ways. And the global stock take is one avenue where they've actually been invited to partake, and so they really took advantage of that. Um, I would say that um, this this happened um, kind of in an interesting way because one of the big asks for from these non-state actors was that, was that the findings of the global stock take not just be kind of like this point in time assessment of you know we already know that the international community isn't doing enough right I think that's fairly easy to say um, but, but these the NGOs in the room were really pushing for we need the findings to be action oriented we need the findings to point towards best practices that are actually working in other areas um, or point out pitfalls. Where have countries seen mal maladaptation happen? Or where have countries like not actually seen policies um, work in a way that has, has um, you know, gotten towards actual decarbonization? Um, and so that was an interesting point because I think we're gonna see, hopefully, um, that the findings next year will have some of these like best practices like built into them so that they point us in a way and I think that's that's um if, if I had to glean some insights that was maybe where they're trying to push sort of that that um updated NDC and like a greater ambition. Um so I think we'll just have to wait and see what happens next year. <laughs> Thank you. Unfortunately, we shouldn't just sit and wait what happens next. It's really up to all of us to make action happen, and particularly you as a lecture student uh, or a very advanced and very smart and very capable. Uh, we do rely on you to get involved in uh, whether it's at the national level, subnational level, NGO, advocacy, whatever it is, and we'll do whatever you can.
Um, but there's, as you can hear from all the things that have been presented here, there's many different topics, there's many different avenues uh, happening all at the same time. So it's very complicated, but it also means there's many, uh, many ways to get involved uh, and many possible ways to move forward on, on the agenda, even though, uh, particularly on the mitigation side, we have in terms of scale so far to go, and that is a big challenge. Um, Instead of asking my question, since we don't have a lot of time left, I'd rather give you the opportunity to ask your questions uh, to any of the panelists, uh, whether it be big, small, whatever it may be. Yes. I'd love to hear a little bit about the behind the scenes on the push for the inclusion of the cell of oil and gas language. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Quite remarkably, uh, when the Indians first offered the language, uh, so this was to phase down all fossil fuels. So in Glasgow, it had been phase out, phase versus phase down. In India, it had been sort of, you know, it's like musical chairs, you know, when the music stops, India didn't have a chair. <laughs> it, 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 the Chinese were probably, you know, as, as much if not more to sort of, it blames the wrong word, but, you know, trying to make sure we didn't get to phase out language. but the Indians offered this phase down all fossil fuels. They're taking the heat off coal, which is you know an issue for them, but also I think correctly putting the emphasis on all fossil fuels. If we listen to the IEA, the IPCC, um, 80 countries supported that language. And there was a moment when uh, the EU, the UK, Canada went to the presidency <clears throat> and sort of said, look, you know. Where's the cup of text? You're going to get moving here. I mean, it was a sort of it was a it was a friend's intervention. At that point, they had more than 80 countries in support of this language, and they they pushed quite hard and sort of said, look, you know, we think we've got support for this language. Um, and then the High Ambition Coalition had a, a press a press conference, basically again sort of saying that this time with Vanuatu and others on the podium saying, look, you know, we've got a lot of countries in support. Um, from what I can tell, uh, is that there was a fairly strong, and you talked about the, the, the superpowers and the, the, the G77. I think there was a very strong influence on this COP presidency and this COP from Saudi Arabia, from Russia, and from some of the sort of, you know, um, uh, petro states. Mm -hmm. And against, you know, where I think the EU's position was and others. And I think that that stopped this language going into document in, in, in different ways. And you also saw um, a very heavy hand on the tiller uh, from, from those groups around a number of other things, which could have been achieved in the document, I think, if the cover text had come out earlier, if there had been a process around the cover text, if the way in which the cover text had been managed in Glasgow had been sort of replicated. Now, there's lots of things to criticize the Brits about and the way that they manage Glasgow, but I think they managed the cover text quite well. And when you look at the two processes side by side, you can see why perhaps some things just got left out in the end, because it's just too difficult. There wasn't enough of a, of a landing zone. It will be interesting to see how the UAE approached the, the president's cover text. And it'll be interesting to see what Simon Steele thinks that a COP needs to look like before we get to COP28. But it was there for the taking um, uh, and it had more than 80 countries in support that didn't make it into the text. Yeah. So our uh, right? question is, uh, like, you see for South South cooperation of procuring our and information for technology and Yeah, that's question. Yeah, um, the, the question is, will we see more South-South cooperation for R&D funds? That was just totally not talked about. Uh, I mean, maybe at the very, you know, margin. Uh, but yeah, that's exactly what I was sort of pointing to when I said, what are we, where are we going to get, where, where are we going to get more climate finance um, for everything, uh, but including R&D? Um, and and I think one answer is that there could be much more South South cooperation. I mean, however we just define the South, right? Um, and I think that is a question we've got to confront in the context of the UNFCCC. 
when the UNFCCC was negotiated um, and adopted in 1992, you know, there were some countries that were nowhere close to where they are today. I mean, China is a great example, right? In 1992, Chinese emissions were actually negligible. <laughs> Um, and then since then, we've seen, you know, really after the year 2000, a tremendous growth in emissions, but also in wealth. Um, and, and so we're at a, a point in time now that is very different. And we have these enormous needs um, on the part of <clears throat> less developed countries, special circumstances in Africa. Um, and and I think the onus is on these countries to come up with a different approach. And you know, one one idea that I floated in a foreign affairs article right at the beginning of the COP was that we take a nationally determined approach to finance, in the same way that we have taken a nationally determined approach to emissions reductions, where each country says, "What can I do? You know, what can I do in terms of my?" domestic finance and how much I can mobilize within my country and what can I do to help other countries and this might be a way to break through this bifurcated regime that we have right now where only advanced industrialized countries are mobilized in finance um, and I also think it might help us bring in the private sector on a national basis where we think about what the the private sector in each country can contribute. Um, I don't know if this will work, but it was one idea that I was trying to just float to get, you know, some initial discussion of how we need some new approaches, right? This is clearly not working. And the, the same approaches that we were using 20, 30 years ago, I mean, really our approach to climate finance is really the approach we use under the Montreal Protocol on substances that deplete the ozone layer, right? Um, and so we, we've got to have something that's fit for purpose and modernized um, and, and scalable. One more question. Yeah, students first. Yeah, well, there's two. Yeah. yeah, I think we can go a little over. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. so was there a hand over here? Yeah. So we'll go to you, you, and then Rafa. Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask some questions about the progress in the voluntary carbon market and potential sort of pitfalls that folks have pointed out. Um, firstly, about the inability to include indigenous peoples and local communities to the greatest extent. Um, and wondering about how that's going to affect the efficacy of the voluntary and compliance market mm -hmm. because those communities do have control and ownership over a lot of the land to use for natural climate solutions. Um, and uh, the second question being, um, how are we going to um, balance, I would say, like increase in uh, uh, activity in the voluntary carbon market with um, need for uh, maintaining um, food security um, and how we're going to do this? Well, I, mean, I think the, 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 the slip back in language was in Article 6, so that refers to that, so that will affect compliance markets, right? So um, I think within the BCMs, um, the, the sort of structure that's being built into the, into the voluntary carbon markets, um, you know, so this is, a, so you have to remember that this is the voluntary use of carbon markets by corporates and then the regimes that are the, the, the processes and structures that develop that countries put in place uh, in order to be able to exploit voluntary card markets for the needs that they have. Right? So in the work that's being done with countries to make sure that they are ready and able to use the voluntary card markets in a way that will allow the revenues to flow to what they need to flow to and that they can attract high integrity uh, buyers. Um, I think in, in most of that support work, the, the role of rights holders, indigenous peoples and or other communities, that's still there. So the language slipped back on Article 6, that has to be corrected in COP28, but I think in the way that the voluntary carbon markets are developing and the way that they're being supported, um, there's been a big step forward in the way in which indigenous groups are and, and nations are in, in, involved and, and how that support work is going on. So 
slowly, slowly, but I think that that's still there. And I <clears throat> moderated a meeting on the middle Saturday with all of the actors in the voluntary carbon market space. And it was very clear that whatever was going on in Article 6, you know, this is what this is what needs to happen. I think your second question, the voluntary carbon markets today are about a $2 billion market. So, uh, which has gone from 300 million in 2019, but it's not at 50 or 60 or 70 billion. It's gone to 2 billion. And demand is really soft at the moment. And the growth is slowing. Why? Because if you're a corporate buyer, you are extremely nervous that you're not accessing a high integrity credit or the rules for whether that's a high integrity credit are going to move on you from some reason, or that somebody's going to actually wake up and start regulating you, God forbid, in this country. But, you know, I mean, so you're, you've, you've got lots of reasons to be quite nervous. However, you have, if you're a financial actor, you've got hundreds of clients who desperately need to get into the voluntary card markets because they're not going to get to net zero without some kind of involvement in the current market for, the, for that which they cannot manage within their value chain uh, and, and that which they cannot manage uh, by just reducing the emissions. And so there's this huge pressure from corporates to get into the car markets. And then the intermediaries are like, ah, oh, this is really complicated. So I think the focus over the next year will continue to be to building the rules and trying to build a little bit more security around being able to enter into the markets with high integrity, which means that the exchanges that are being set up are very, very important, that they only accept high integrity credit, that the work of the ICBCM, which will report out in March, on uh, how to um, understand from a principal point of view when a, when a carbon credit is a high integrity is very important. And then thirdly, you're going to start to see buyers clubs operating in the market where they will do their own high quality due diligence. There was an announcement yesterday from a new entity that set up with some very big financial players. There'll be another one announcing next week. So I think that there is, there is a preponderance of actors of goodwill who, who want to see a high integrity voluntary car market. Whether, whether they're successful or not, I don't know, but there's enough good, act, good there's enough actors of goodwill, both on the buyer side and the seller side, to try to get something uh, going. And, and it was interesting to me that the most criticism of the Article 6 negotiators was coming from some of the captains of industry and captains of plants, as well as from developing countries that have nature stocks, because they were like, this is the last thing we need. You guys have got to get serious. Yeah. Uh, so, as, as re reading on the ECB policy to decarbonize its corporate bond holdings in its monetary policy, so as an alternative nudge yeah. for financial markets. So, is this a valid or an alternative nudge for financial markets, or is it something which did not gain traction at all? Because it appears to be a good framework, at least, to harmonize the climate performance of bond purchases. Bond purchases. So, I mean, I don't know what uh, Kelly may want to say something, but I, I, think it's, I think it's very important. I think it was hard fought. I, it was, I'm glad that they announced it when they did. Um, I, you, you, we should start, we should see similar things happening in other jurisdictions. And the People's Bank of China obviously has a slightly different approach, but something analogous and there's some very interesting conversations going on in Delhi. So, and then the US has got its own, um, you know, processes. I think that what we were trying, I think what some people were trying to do in, in, um, in, uh, in Sham was to try to introduce language, um, which would, under 2.1c, which would just delineate, it would list, basically, it would just be a laundry list of all the things that are happening in the in, in the FSB, in the BIS, in the ECB, in the IMF Research Department, uh, in Chicago uh, Commodities, uh, um, at the SEC, yeah, and on and on and on and on. Um, the things the things that um, NGFS are doing. I mean, just to list all the things that are going on within the financial architecture of the, of the global markets, and sort of just hook it in somehow as a laundry list. Because then next year, governments you know, could be asked, well, and what have you done under 2.1c? Right, so did you ask your regulator to get with the program? Did you, you know, did you put your banking supervisory commission to go and look at strategic risk, et cetera? So did you do anything with your bond markets? We, we weren't able to do that. And actually, I think it was another one of those things where there were plenty of governments in support of it. 
but because the cover text was so slow and the negotiation was so slow that it didn't happen. Um, so I think it's very important. I think it's very timely. I think it's going to have an impact. But it's we've got the situation where the climate negotiations are here and the global economy conversation is sort of here and the, the links between the two are quite weak. Okay. Um, so I wanted to ask about the ocean. Um, so how was shipping, blue carbon, nature-based solutions, and other things covered that are ocean oriented so that, or was this yet another terra central cause? <laughs> did you go to the ocean pavilion? I think everybody did. Yeah. Okay, I'll give you one on, on shipping. Um, just, yeah. So I, yeah. Yeah. so I think the, the sort of zero uh, emissions uh, vessels conversation is clearly moving forward. And I'll ask you very briefly about, about others, but this was the green, this was the green hydrogen and cop, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah. like last year, there were some side events on green hydrogen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This ebbed everything, the green hydrogen everywhere, all the time, whatever. And so there were, and there were big, reasonably big sort of, Geographically specific conversations going on. So, Chile, uh, Morocco, uh, obviously Egypt got its big gas deal, you know, yeah. at the beginning, and the presidency kind of like took his put off the accelerator after that. Um, and then uh, other conversations around green hydrogen, uh, South Africa, Namibia, etc. Um, but the green hydrogen zero vessels conversations yeah. kind of uh, fused, and there were a number of events really around that. Uh, blue carbon, I think there was a lot of conversations around blue carbon in terms of ultra carbon markets, some really interesting stuff going on, you know, and but that's mainly sea grasses, mangroves, yeah. etc. Yeah. The high seas blue carbon, uh, the kind of stuff that um, our alumna, uh, Alicia, uh, yeah. goes, uh, is working on, I didn't hear very much of that, but I wasn't in the interview. She was there. Yeah, she was there. Yeah. Uh, I will read you the decision. <laughs> encourages party to consider as appropriate ocean-based action in their national climate goals and in the implementation of these goals including but not limited to the ndc's long-term strategies and adaptation communication very weak there was also there was also a controversial addition of oceans in article six language yeah. which people are worried uh, brings in the idea of oceans removals right. into the carbon yeah, market, which, it, which has right. all kinds of squirrels yes, and loop, loop associates. Yeah. Yeah. Even I was in the negotiation with the nation, I was happy, so I was there. Yeah. Yeah. There, was, there were a big discussion about this. So, right. trying to include how to include mm -hmm. the yeah. discussion. So, I think everybody was agreed, included, included, yeah. included yeah. but yeah. how mm -hmm. to include the word. That's yeah. a good question. Uh, uh, yeah. 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 Um, right. There was a lot of Africa. I know. 